Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Washington Memorial Chapel. We're so pleased that you are joining us today and we're so grateful for this cool weather, aren't we? If this is your first time worshiping with us, check in the back of the pew for a guest card that looks just like this. We invite you to fill it out. And when you're done, either give it to an usher who are there at the back of the church or place it in the collection plate so that we can follow up with you to see how we might further serve you here at the chapel. Uh, this coming Monday, that's tomorrow, August 15th, we will celebrate the Feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now that's one of the major feasts in the Episcopal Church. So please join us at 12, 10 p.m. for this special said mass. An exciting time this week. We want you to get ready for the highlight of the Caroline concert season. If you haven't been to one of the Caroline concerts on a Wednesday night, this is the one you don't want to miss. On this Wednesday, August 17th at 7.30 p.m., the award-winning Irish Thunder Pipes and Drums Band is coming. And that's something that everybody looks forward to every year. Last year, because of the weather, we had to cancel. So we're looking forward to good weather this week, and they will be here. This performance is always packed, so please get there early and bring your chairs with you so you can enjoy a good seat out in the beautiful grove. Um, there will be a warm-up act for this one. Our own resident Carolinier, Doug Geffert, will perform sing-alongs to our favorite tunes from Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales. And as always, the Cabin Shop Cafe will be open to provide dinner for you, uh, including an ice cream sundae bar. So if you haven't checked that out, please come down and check it out. Doing service this weekend, that's today. This morning, we will lift a special loose plate offering. All monies collected will go to outreach to be donated for school supplies for children in our community who are in need. Loose plate is defined as any cash or coin or a check with outreach written on the four line of your check. So in addition to your regular offering, please be generous so that we can help children in our community return to school with the supplies that they will need to have a successful school year. Finally, after uh, service this morning, Janet helped me with this one, there will be coffee hour, and where will it be? In the lobby, thank you, Johanna. <laughs> in the lobby at room, there will be coffee hour, and this really is the ideal time for you to get to know your fellow parishioners. So we encourage you to join us after this. You can go back and uh, shake Father Steve's hand, and then come back this way to the Lafayette Room and join us for a really lovely coffee hour. Again, welcome to Washington Memorial Chapel.
in our cycle of prayer this morning. We pray for Colorado. Let us pray. Blessed, high, and holy Lord, the people who live under the eaves of our continent, bless the rocky peaks of their golden, rude land, which pluck the crystal snow from heaven to refresh the earth on every side with water pure. Guard, O oh God, the mountain passes, the spruce and lovely aspen sentinels upon their crests. Protect the lowly sleep, sheep and patient cattle in their verdant valleys. Prosper the seed by man's labor planted. So, loving Father, do thou keep thy Colorado children in the beauty of their lofty climb and the joy of their unspoiled hope. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be you. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given us thine only Son to be unto us both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly love, give us grace that we may always thankfully receive that his inestimable benefit and also daily endeavor ourselves to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first Old Testament lesson is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23. Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back? Those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit in their own heart. They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord. Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and let a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. The word of the Lord. Let us all say Psalm 82 responsively. God standeth in the congregation of princes. He is a judge among gods. Defend the poor and fatherless. See that such as are in need and necessity have right. They will not be learned nor understand but walk on still in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. The second lesson in the epistle is taken from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raising fire, raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death and they were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains 
and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to thee, O Lord. Jesus said, I come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five and one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided. 
father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be a scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. When St. Mark began his gospel, his first sentence was, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And forever afterwards, the gospel has been thought of as the good news, as indeed it is. When I was a kid, I was told that good news was, that the word gospel was an old German word for good news. Actually, it isn't. It's an old German word for God's words. However, the idea of the gospel being good news comes from St. Luke's gospel. When the angels appeared to the shepherds, their proclamation was the good news. Behold, we bring you good news of a great joy, for born to you is this day is a savior who is Christ the King. So good news is the way we think of the gospel. And the reason I bring all of that up is because today's reading doesn't sound like good news at all. In fact, it sounds like bad news. It starts out with talk about fire, and talk about division, and talk about a fiery baptism that Jesus must undergo. And if I were to try to find one word to sort of summarize today's reading, that word would be shattering. This reading sort of shatters our placid, quiet, idealistic ways of thinking of Jesus. So often we think of Jesus as the gentle shepherd, as he is. And some of the images of Jesus show him lovingly carrying a sheep on his shoulders, returning the sheep to the flock, which is true. We remember Jesus inviting the children to come and be with them and saying, such as these shall inherit the kingdom of God. It's all true. Those are wonderful images, but they're not the only image. And this morning's reading shatters that, that sense of Jesus as only the gentle, gentle Savior. He is the Savior, but the salvation of humanity is not always a gentle thing. And that's what this passage reminds us of. Very often in our faith, we tend to think of our faith as being Christmas-oriented. We all love Christmas, and who wouldn't? The carols, and the gift-giving, and the festiveness, and Merry Christmas to everybody, and the shepherds, and the manger, and the babe lying in swaddling clothes. They're beautiful, beautiful images. But the church also contains the images of Holy Week, of betrayal, of denial, of crucifixion, of cruel death. And in some ways, this morning's narrative is sort of the Holy Week narrative to balance out the Christmas sense that most of us have. So if we're going to be guided by anything, I am guided today by something that was said by C.S. Lewis in his letters to Malcolm. To Malcolm he wrote, whenever we have an idea of God, God, in his mercy, shatters it. Whenever we think we understand God, whenever we think we can, we can figure God out, whenever we think we can manage or manipulate God to our, own, to our own desires, our own happiness, our own feelings of well-being, that's when God, in his mercy, shatters that. Because God cannot be contained. And the love of God is more than we can imagine. And so this shattering takes place in the first sentence. I have come to bring fire on the earth. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by this. After all, John the Baptist has already announced it. 
when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, he said, or before he baptized him, he said, I will baptize you with water so that you will be cleansed. The one who is coming after me will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about how Jesus has his winnowing fork in his hand and he's on the threshing floor and he will separate the wheat from the chaff. There are very powerful images of the coming of God for our salvation, but not as some pleasant thing, as really something very powerful that's happening. God, in his coming in Christ, is going to bring the fire of God's presence into our existence. The fire of God's love, the fire of God's truth, the fire of God's mercy, the fire of God's forgiveness, the fire of God's compassion for all people, even people we hate, God has compassion for them. And that upsets the equilibrium which we try to build around us. It upsets the status quo of the world. Status quo just means the state of things. That's all it means. But what it fully means is the existing state of affairs as they are now. And there are many people who are very interested in maintaining the status quo. And as Jesus comes into the world, he brings fire, at least as far as the Pharisees and the scribes are concerned, he brings fire, at least as far as, as Herod, King Herod and Pontius Pilate are concerned. He comes in to upset the status quo. He comes in to throw the world off balance and, bring, and build it anew. So that's where we begin in this story. We shouldn't be surprised because the Blessed Virgin Mary, on her way to see Elizabeth, when Jesus was still in her womb, sings a wonderful song called the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And then she goes on to describe how the Lord is going to lower the mighty from their seats and lift up the lowly and the poor. She's talking about social disruption. This child that she's carrying in her womb is going to bring with him a disruption of the way we normally do business. And we know that because we saw that in the ministry of Jesus. Everything Jesus did was what the status quo says not to do. When he sees a leper, you're supposed to get on the other side of the road and stay away from the leper. Otherwise, you'll be contaminated. Jesus does the opposite. He goes to the leper. And he heals the leper, even touches the leper. When he sees a poor person, he reaches out to help the poor person. When he sees a sinner, society says you stay away from sinners because they'll lead you down a bad path. Society always reminds me of my mother when I was a teenager. She said, stay away from bad people. But Jesus doesn't do that. He has dinner with the sinners. He cavorts with the sinners, not cavorts, but he joins with the sinners. I didn't mean to say cavorted with them. But you know, the point I'm trying to get at is that all the things that society says Jesus shouldn't do, according to the Torah, according to the law, and according to the way we've always done things, that's exactly what Jesus does. And that's part of the fire that he brings into the world. But we shouldn't be surprised, because that fire is what he's been doing all along. And the second thing is that it comes at great cost. The second part of this is that Jesus has to undergo a baptism of fire. And that's his crucifixion. That's his horrible death on the cross. This salvation of humanity comes at great cost. Great cost to God, great cost to Jesus. So very often we listen for and love the beautiful passages in the scripture that give us comfort. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a powerful and beautiful sentence that is from the scripture. But so often we listen to the good words. God so loved the world. Well, that's good. God loves the world. That he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish. Good. We're not going to perish. That's wonderful. And have everlasting life. That's all wonderful. But how often we overlook those middle words, those little words in the middle. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he sacrificed to a painful death his only begotten son, to the end that all that believe in him may find salvation. And that's the fire of God. 
and it costs dearly. The fire of God coming into the world to bring us salvation, which really means little more than our hearts being amended. That's what salvation finally is. That great calling for Ash Wednesday, you know, God Almighty God, you love the world you have made, you forgive the sins of all who are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts. That's what salvation is. For God to enter into our world physically and with fire and with purpose, to create and make in us new and contrite hearts. That word contrite is from the Latin word contire, and literally that means to grind, to make in us new and ground down hearts. It's also used to refer the way a person gets a piece of sculptor or a piece of brass that they want to refer. They have to grind it. They have to grind away all the rust and all the stuff that's built up over the years. And that's what God is about. God is receiving us as we are, but renewing us with a new spirit and grinding us so that we become renewed people. That's what salvation finally is. And it's not an easy process. And it causes divisions. And that's the third thing that this passage reminds us of the divisions, the family divisions. And it's a little disheartening to hear Jesus with this seemingly inexhaustible list of all the divisions that are going to happen. You know, sons against fathers, daughters against mothers, daughters-in-law against sons-in-law, sons-in-law. It it's goes on and on and on. And you think, when will it end? And yet, we should remember that divisions have always been with us. And those kinds of divisions that are inaugurated by this entry of God into the world is something that we have to go through in order to be reborn. Think about the parable of the prodigal son. Is there a more popular parable in the Bible than the parable of the prodigal son? And yet, that's a story of family divisions. You know the story well. The story is of the youngest son who's sick and tired of being with his father who doesn't recognize his father's love, or certainly doesn't appreciate his father's love. And so he says to his father, I want to go away. I want to go find myself. I want to make my own path. I want to become my own person. I want to go someplace where I can live my life the way I want to. Sounds like me when I was a teenager. And the great love of the, of the father is that he allows the son to do that. Even when the son says, horrifyingly, give me my share of the inheritance so that I may go and live my own life. What a dreadful thing for a young man to say to his father. Basically, he's saying, my life would be better off if you were dead. That's the effect of what he's saying. It's a very powerful family division. And that's what inaugurates the story of the prodigal son. And the father allows the son to go. Of course, the son repents. The son, he comes to himself. He recognizes the love his father had for him. And he goes back in order to beg forgiveness, but he doesn't have to, because that father comes out. That father comes out to greet him and to meet him. That father comes out to wrap his arms around him, to wrap a robe around him, to wrap a, thing, a, a ring around his finger. That father comes out to restore him to the family. And what we see here is the extravagant love of the father, that unimpeachable love of the father that love which, which cannot ever be diminished. And that's the love of God. It's a love that lets him go. It's a love that receives him back. And that's what animates the story of the prodigal son. And just when we think all the family divisions are over, here comes the older brother. And he recognizes his father's love, but he's not happy about it. It's okay to love me because I've been loyal, but you can't love him because he has been disloyal. Why are you going to throw a party for this guy who went away and squandered all his inheritance? It's that love of God, that extravagant love of God, which here is causing a division. And again, the father's love is so powerful that he comes out this time to embrace and to encourage and to console his angry and resentful older son. The prodigal son story in the end is really a story of God's love. It's really a story of the fire of God's love entering into our world. 
We do live in families where we are separated. We do live in families where there are divisions. We do live in families that are one against another. And what can overcome that? We have in the story of the prodigal son a story of a family that's about to explode into a million different directions. And the only thing that pulls it together is this love of God, this imperishable love of God, the love shown by the Father. And I believe that that's the one thing that's going to hold us together in the divisions that we are going through currently and really have gone through all throughout human history. If we can somehow harness that love of God in our own lives, then we would begin to see our hearts being moved and changed. And we are invited to become members of a transcendental family, a transcendent family, the family of God. St. Paul referred to it as simply, we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs. We are the children of God, members of a transcendent family. And in a few minutes, you will hear the Eucharist, and you will hear the priest say, this is my blood given for you, a blood of a new covenant. That new covenant is the family that you and I are members of, and we are invited to come forward and take our place at the table of this transcendent family. And that transcendent family is not in place of our own family, but it enhances our own family. And that transcendent family is finally what we're entitled to join. So it sounds like bad news, I know it does, but it's the fire of God's love, it's the fire of God's presence, it's the fire of God's truth. And there are divisions, but the divisions can be overcome. But we need to learn how to see the presence of God all around us. We can interpret the weather, we know when it's gonna be warm, but can we interpret the presence of God all around us? Can we see the signs of God's love trying to become known in the flux of our lives? Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As of the people. In peace we pray to thee, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of thy creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, 
or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Daniel, our bishop, Tommy and Tim, our priests, and all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, O Lord. For thy mercy is great. We thank thee, O Lord, for all the blessings of this life, and most especially for the faithful witness of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of all thy saints. We will exalt thee, O God, our King. And praise thy name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died and that they may have a place in thine eternal kingdom. Lord, let thy loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in thee. We pray to thee also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In thy compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by thy spirit, that we may live and serve thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sin to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sin, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, Creator of light and source of life, who hast made us in thine image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy and gracious Father, in thine infinite love thou didst make us for thyself. And when we had fallen into sin and became subject to evil and death, thou didst mercifully send Jesus Christ, thine only begotten and eternal Son, to share our humanity, to live and die as one of us, and to reconcile us unto thee, who art the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and made there an offering of himself in obedience to thy will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night in which he was betrayed unto suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks unto thee, he brake it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sin. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving recalling his blessed death and mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, we offer unto thee these gifts. Sanctify them, we beseech thee, by thy Holy Spirit, that they may be for thy people, the body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Do thou likewise sanctify us, thy servants, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament, and serve thee in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all the blessed and glorious Virgin Mary and with all thy saints into the joy of thine eternal kingdom. All this we ask through thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end, Amen. And now as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Behold, he that taketh away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed.
Lord be with you. And thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members incorporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thine everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. May God have us always in his holy keeping. May we depart in peace and be kindly affectioned one to another. And now may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost rest upon you this day and embrace you forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks. Thanks to God.